In this video, I'm going to break down the entire GPU pipeline from a single frame of Silent Hill 2 Remake. After analyzing the frame, I'll point out the missed optimization opportunities developers didn't take advantage of while presenting optimized settings we discovered for players and what we use in our capture. Plus, I'll reveal a massive performance killer in the game and show you how to disable it. It was a last minute decision to cover this game, but after a friend suggested I try it out, I found some interesting details and a few baffling developer choices that definitely need to be addressed in an update. These are important issues that need to be discussed, and I don't trust other tech influencers to explain them properly to a wider audience. I need to quickly clarify that while I do have strong negative opinions regarding some technical aspects, it is incredible games like Silent Hill 2 Remake that make the issues we focus on on this channel so much more painful to see in modern games. And I highly recommend reading our full appreciation letter to Bloober Team posted on our Threat Interactive Twitter account. Now, let's dive deeper into the performance aspect. The difference between optimized settings and max settings is huge. The two biggest factors are going to be shadow quality and shading quality. While the impact of shadows was expected, lowering the shading quality significantly improved performance, with only noticeable changes in the translucent materials, such as the glass on this van. Funny enough, it also supposedly reduces hair quality, but if you're like us and don't appreciate temporal smear abuse, you might actually find the hair looking better and less abusively dithered. People quickly realized that forcing DirectX 11 through Steam or shortcut commands improved performance. But let me explain why DirectX 11 performs better and show you how to achieve similar performance in DirectX 12 so you can still keep your hardware ray tracing support if that's your preference. When Unreal Engine 5 is running in DirectX 11, Nanite rendering is not supported. If you've watched our Nanite video, you'll know that Nanite only performs better if the developers haven't optimized things like topology or quad overdraw. Even then, Nanite is still much slower in comparison to optimized non-Nanite content. Someone at Bloober team seemed aware of this issue, but didn't fully optimize the topology. Using Unreal Engine 5 Unlocker in DX12 mode, open the command line and enter the command on screen. For example, a 4080 owner, who happens to be the person who suggested this game, was playing at 1440p. When I asked him to run this command, he gained 20 frames during a live Discord stream, with no noticeable visual difference. When I tested it on our studio's standard hardware setup, we gained around 7fps. This ties back on a discussion on Nanite and Quad Overdraw. I showed in our Nanite video how non-Nanite rendering can leak performance due to quads created from every 2x2 two two pixels. Let's say you're rendering at 1080p and you increase the resolution to 4K. As the resolution increases, the size of each pixel and more importantly, the quads get smaller relative to the same triangles. Smaller quads and larger triangles are key to reducing quad overdraw, which means less performance leakage. This is why Nanite has less of an impact at 1080p. I was seeing more quad overdraw at 1080p compared to my 1440p counterpart. Since we're not focused on hardware ray tracing in this video, and are aiming to show the best performance possible, we capture frame analysis in DirectX 11. This also allows our capture software to gather more detailed information for us to show you. We're running the game at 1080p with a V-Sync enabled on a 60Hz display. There is no frame cap due to severe CPU issues like the last game we analyzed. We've also modified the TAA again which we'll explain in more detail later in the video. Here's the specific commands we use and you can copy them from our pinned comment. The performance cost of these settings is extremely minimal. Speaking of temporal console variables, upscaler plugins like DLSS, FSR3, etc. when installed on UE5 integrate new console variables defined by plugin developers. PSSR is no different, but what I found interesting is that the PSSR uses terminology you only find in the XCSS plugin. Comment down below what you think about that. Here is the frame we captured in DX11. Since there are many issues with image consistency, we analyze the environment from the same perspective and settings as our capture. The atmosphere is solid, crisp thanks to our modified TAA settings, however that does mean other elements start to fall apart quickly. The environment is mostly static, but the developers force dynamic GI, which is not only expensive, but results in splotchy visuals in a game that would be perfect for higher quality baked lighting. Lumen, UE5's dynamic lighting system, despite its several years worth of development time, remains as an embarrassment to both Epic and everyone involved with this game's production. But if you voice this opinion to Lumen developers or major tech influencers, they'll blame you for not wanting to coat your image quality in temporal slop. The hair looks fine with our chosen settings, but let's talk about the fog. To isolate the fog's true instability, I'll remove Lumen completely from the scene and reduce the skylight intensity. 
The fog, when combined with TSR, an expensive, gelatinous-like and incompetent form of TAA, can hide the fog's issues as intended by Unreal's developers. But just because it's intended does not make it acceptable. If you enable no TAA or half-competent TAA, you'll immediately notice jittering in the fog. Luckily, there's an engine command that can help increase the fog's independent temporal accumulation. Just bump the default value by 0 0.05. It works fine here, but keep in mind that this tweak can cause the fog to respond slower to changes to the environment and to lighting. Now let's talk about the reflections. Lumen is divided into two parts, one part global illumination and the other the reflection system. Lumen GI can function without Lumen reflections, but Lumen reflections cannot work without Lumen GI, at least into Unreal Engine 5.5. To make things clear, the game forces both the GI and ray march reflections. The ray tracing option simply toggles between sign distance field representation or hardware mesh tracing for lumen calculations. Contrary to some claims, there are no Q maps involved here. Just like how we increase the fog's temporal accumulation to stabilize it, you can do something similar for lumen GI by raising the default command on screen from a value of 10 to 30. You'll see similar pros and cons as with the fog. Lumen is already heavily temporal, which causes a lot of ghosting initially. And while this command might slightly worsen the ghosting, it significantly reduces flickering. Now that we've dealt with the image discontinuity, let's dive into the pipeline analysis. As in our UE4 analysis, the pipeline begins with dispatches. In Jedi Survivor, we saw over 400 dispatches at the start of the frame. In Silent Hill 2, we only see about 95 dispatches. That's over 75% fewer than the last frame we analyzed. After the dispatches, the GPU moves to the early Z-Pass. For this video, we'll break down the pass into two parts. The first focuses on geometry, while the second handles elements like alpha-tested foliage. Here is a rough time-lapse of the drawing order for the first half, followed by the second half. Now, here's the entire pass combined. Once the early Z-Pass is complete, the pipeline proceeds with occlusion testing, followed by around 400 related draws. In our previous analysis, we saw as many as 1,700 of these draws, but in this game is significantly reduced. During this stage, the GPU builds hierarchical Z-Buffers and creates separate render targets to store decal information, which will be applied to the main Z-Buffers later. I'm a bit interested in seeing some research proving whether or not this approach is more efficient than just writing directly to the finished Z-Buffers like we saw in the UE4 pipeline. Once the decal buffers are written to, the pipeline begins processing the standard G buffers. The lighting from the skylight is also processed. The scene contains around 3.3 million triangles and quad overdraw is very serious. Despite the early Z pass minimizing fragment reshading, single pixel overdraw is pretty significant. Once the geometry buffers are completed, more dispatches follow, focusing on these textures and decal related draws. Immediately afterwards, the GPU creates lower resolution versions of the normal and depth buffers to compute a lower resolution ambient occlusion buffer, which is then upscaled to native resolution. This is the fastest SSAO processing we've analyzed on the channel so far, taking only about 0.6 milliseconds. Next, the GPU draws additional decals, this time likely related to the translucent geometry such as the glass windows on this van. These elements, however, will be used in the next stage of the frame, which involves lumens calculations. The GPU updates the global illumination stored as atlases, and then accounts for any temporal or normal changes, and combines the new frame's results with the lighting accumulation buffer. About halfway through, the GPU performs ray marching and screen space tracing for reflections. Once the lighting is combined, subsurface scattered objects are shaded on the newly lit buffer, and then fog shading is applied, followed by translucence. Our modified TAA is then applied. And while we can't see subpixel sampling in real time, the image appears more jagged than it actually does during high frame rate viewing. We refer to this version of TAA as half competent because although it reduces blur, it has two issues that can be easily fixed. First, it doesn't provide enough subpixel sampling to fully reduce jagged edges. This could be fixed if post process AA was integrated between blended frames. It also suffers from ghosting if the background is complex enough. This is caused by using an accumulation buffer that layers all the past frames, and could be fixed if we just use the standalone previous frame with the post-process anti-aliasing applied. Next, the GPU calculates velocity data for motion blur, but since nothing is moving in the frame, it doesn't affect the image. The buffers are aggressively MIP-chained, and the final color grading is applied to complete the frame. 
Here's a rough estimate of the millisecond budget using the optimized settings we covered. This is just a rough estimate that adds up to the total millisecond timing the engine itself reports with VSync off and 100% GPU utilization. Now, let's talk about a few things related to the pipeline. First, there is nothing in the frame that justifies the initial dispatches at the start of the budget. It's unreasonable, and they're not even related to Lumen, which is arguably the most complex system in the frame. I'll explain further while giving you a little more context about this timing listed in our millisecond budget. I did another experiment turning off all the graphical options offered in the menu. Then I turn off systems like Lumen, DFAO, Spatial Upscaling, Fog, and other scalability console variables. Then, I lifted the camera to face the sky and capped the frame rate to 60 FPS. Capturing this frame still contains those initial dispatches, and uses one-tenth of the GPU's power. To stress my point, this wasn't captured at 1080p. It was captured at 15% of 1080p. The biggest issue in the frame is geometry. Both the pre-pass and base pass costs are extremely high. And foliage is particularly tough on GPUs because it doesn't align well with quad rendering, even when alpha tested as done in very efficient engines like Decima. The heaviest geometry in the scene comes from the trees which account for more than half the geometry processing time. That makes a little bit of sense if you measure how much the frame's surface area they make up, but you can see how much processing power they take. In comparison with these far higher poly objects taking up more than one third of the frame's surface area. Our capture settings had shadows on low, which due to Fortnite logic turns shadows completely off and unreal. But taking a capture in the beginning scene with shadows enabled shows us that the developers thankfully took action in excluding most of the floors from shadow maps but the problematic trees continue to induce further performance problems due to not being excluded. This is really unfortunate to find since screen space shadows as seen in Days Gone or Baked Occlusion could have helped with the trees instead. This would have allowed players to have access to shadow maps without such a detrimental hit to performance. Most of these trees are far away enough that more aggressive LEDs should have been used, and any imperfections could have been easily masked by the fog. Some might suggest using Nanite, since as we've shown on the channel, it outperforms traditional rendering in bad quad overdraw scenarios. However, most of the scene is foliage, likely using WPO for movement. WPO significantly slows down Nanite. In Fortnite, Epic Games got around this issue by baking animations into textures instead of manipulating vertices with WPO. But a system closer to Decima's deferred texturing might have been a better solution, as it's more compatible with alpha-tested foliage. Alright, so let's move on to the lighting stage. Lumen reflections don't cost that much in the scene because there is only a small portion that falls beneath the roughness threshold for lumen reflections. However, the overall lighting looks bad, especially during motion. For instance, take a real-time view underneath the lumen scene. That flickering is from an overly dynamic design, which wastes your GPU power by constantly checking for major scene changes even though the scene is static. Despite multiple requests, the Lumen developers have refused to implement a smarter solution for static environments. Why? Because Fortnite, their ultra-dynamic cash cow, wouldn't benefit from a static-friendly light map alternative. These are the two major opportunities that Bloober Team could have taken advantage of in the engine, which ended up costing you both performance and visual fidelity. And additionally, developers shouldn't have used Nanite for terrain. But this may not have happened if Epic hadn't removed hardware tessellation support from Unreal since 5.0. We've only discussed a fraction of this game's content, but users can now more appropriately judge the game's performance, the studio's competence in optimization, the neglected issues present in UE5, and what actions need to be taken as solutions. While there are many other issues, these were the ones that needed proper discussion. We created this channel to raise awareness about the issues tech influencers often overlook or refuse to address. Many people ask us if we support engines like Godot or Unity, instead of Unreal Engine. The simple answer is no. For years, thousands of engineers and programmers have poured countless hours into coding into these alternative engines, yet their innovations rarely make it into high budget games because these engines are not supported by the industry. It's a tragic waste and it needs to stop. Unreal Engine will power the majority of upcoming titles outside of proprietary engines, but it's also one of the most flawed and problematic in terms of quality and core issues and it's been like this for years because everyone has wasted time trying to make a better alternative. That's why it's our mission to lead the development of new rendering systems, engine modifications, and streamlined workflows that prioritize optimization and photorealism for ninth generation hardware. We are fully committed to building these innovations into a custom version of Unreal Engine 5. 
While these advancements are initially intended for our unannounced project, we plan to make them accessible to developers and the broader Unreal Engine community so that future titles can benefit from the innovations we advocate for. If you support that vision and enjoy the content we produce, all we ask is for a like and subscription to the channel. Comment questions, support, or related research down below to boost the YouTube algorithm in our favor, and share our videos in populated discords and related game subreddits as those prevent us from doing self-promotion but push our view success immensely. We've had many developers reach out to us recently, eager to get involved on issues we're discussing. If you're a graphics programmer or engineer, I highly recommend checking out our pinned comment for details on how to connect with like-minded professionals looking to contribute. That's all we have for today's video, and if you're interested in exploring how the UE5 pipeline differs from the UE4, I suggest watching our Jedi Survivor analysis, where we dive deep into issues with the GPU pipeline and share some excellent optimization tips at the end. Thank you again for your continued support, and take care.